Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is, is Paul Wax. I'm the uh, Executive Director of the American College of Medical Toxicology, and I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar series on the medical and public health considerations of COVID-19. Uh, today, we have a very special presentation, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you all uh, will enjoy it and, and learn uh, a lot. It's, it's not uh, about what's been going on uh, in the U.S. specifically, uh, but the story uh, uh, about uh, what occurred in, in Malta is, is clearly uh, riveting, I, I think, and uh, we look forward to a, a, a robust uh, Q&A at the end, so uh, please put in your questions. The, the title of the talk today is going to be Strategies to Control the Pandemic and a Return to a New Normal in Malta. Next slide. I'd like to thank our webinar series partners for helping to uh, promote our series. Uh, uh, they've done this now for about 17 months and, or 16 months, and I greatly appreciate their ongoing uh, commitment to making this a, a success. Uh, next slide. Uh, we do develop some uh, FAQs for many of our webinars, and this can be found up on our website uh, at asymt.net. Next slide, please. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end of the webinar, as I mentioned. Uh, please type your questions into the Q&A function. And we'll try to get to as many of these as possible. We sometimes go a few minutes over the hour, uh, so for those who can stick around, uh, please do so. If we if we go a little long, next slide. Uh, our speaker does not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Next slide. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my uh, co-moderator for this series, Dr. Ziad Kazi, uh, who's uh, the Secretary Treasurer of ACMT, the past president of the uh, Middle East and North African Clinical Toxicology Association. He's a associate professor at Emory University, and uh, he will uh, be introducing uh, our uh, guest moderator today. Thank you, Dr. Wax, and welcome everyone to this special webinar uh, regarding uh, the pandemic that continues to evolve in Malta. The reason why we uh, look at Malta today for, is for several reasons. Malta is in the middle of the Mediterranean. Uh, although this is a relatively small country compared, for example, to the United States, it's a, uh, it's, it dates back in thousands of years of civilizations, multiple civilizations and cultures going through it. Uh, Malta uh, relies on tourism greatly. And as we all look forward to recovering and traveling again uh, in the U.S. and around the world, the question of traveling safety, safely uh, is really uh, of paramount importance. This is why we uh, turned uh, to our colleagues in Malta to provide their perspective since they rely so much on tourism and they have played a leading role in uh, the recovery and reopening of European countries such as Malta. Uh, this is why uh, we reached out first to Dr. Mark Zamet or Mr. Mark Zamet, who's one of our um, uh, close collaborators from the European Association of Poison Control uh, Centers and Clinical Toxicologists. Mr. Mark is a, uh, also a, a visiting assistant lecturer in the Department of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics at the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery at the University of Malta, and an advanced pharmacy practitioner with the Central Procurement and Supplies Unit at the Ministry of Health of Malta. And he will introduce our speaker. Mark. Thank you, Ziyad, and thank you, Paul. Thank you for the invitation. It is with pleasure that, that I invite my dear friend and esteemed colleague, Professor Sharmin Gauchi. Professor Sharmin Gauchi is uh, professor at the University of Malta in Public Health, and he is also Director General within the Ministry of Health and as, as the Superintendent of Public Health of Malta. She will be delivering a presentation on strategies to control the pandemic and return to a new normal in Malta, medical and public health considerations of COVID-19. The floor is yours, Charmaine. You're muted, Charmaine. You have to switch on the mic. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, it's in the evening here in Malta, and you're in the afternoon. So it's a pleasure to be with you here and also to be able to share our experiences. And hopefully, it will be of an added value to you as well. So, um, starting off with the presentation, um, can you upload the presentation, please? Okay, so the main um, uh, scope of today is looking at an overview. So I would like to share with you the waves of the pandemic, looking at the epidemiology, um, looking at control measures that we had and how we managed to control successive waves of the pandemic. Also, how we did the management of the patients and the resources which were required, um, looking at transition strategy and also the implementation of this, 
communication, which as you will see was very um, important, an important aspect in all this. Looking at vaccination strategy, I would like to share with you how we experienced our strategy, how we worked on it, and how we outrolled it as well. And also for the country, you know, that Malta is an island, so we have some added value in being an island because we don't have um, the traffic from one um, by land travel. Um, and we would like to share that with you as well. And then we can go over to the discussion. So, slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so looking at epidemiology, um, next slide, please. Uh, so basically, um, we know that um, pandemics happen in successive waves. And what happened was that uh, we had started working um, on the planning for this pandemic um, very early, as early as December, when we started seeing the happenings of COVID in China. Um, however, as all of you will understand, and anyone who has actually experienced that pandemic will know the big difference between having a plan on a book, on a paper, or even having had tabletop exercises, but actually when you really come down to it, it's a completely different picture. And this is what we have really experienced. Uh, so our first case happened actually on the night of the 6th um, of March of 2020. And so we reported the first case on the 7th of March. And we actually um, had the control in the beginning. However, then we had a spike of cases and that led to um, control measures whereby we had to um, take drastic action in closing of um, schools, um, limiting the non-essential services, limiting also um, the shops which were open and leaving only the essential services. We also went into um, a lot of people going into um, telework and reducing the actual physical presence on, on the um, workplace. This worked really well um, until um, we approached the summer um, and um, the number of cases tailed down and many people were thinking that this was like a seasonal um, virus and that probably we will pass through summer um, with minimal difficulties. So we reopened our airport on the 1st of July of last year and then we increased further the opening of the airport also um, within another two weeks. However, um, that led to an influx of cases because we started seeing um, a number of um, outbreaks happening, especially many of them which would be linked even to entertainment. Next slide, please. So if you look um, at case clusters that we had around the summer of last year, you would see the that the majority of these um, clusters that we had were actually related um, to parties. Next slide, please. And this is quite typical of what we see um, in pandemics. So if you look at the previous pandemic of the 1918, this looks at the two waves of the deaths that happened during this flu pandemic. And similarly for this COVID pandemic, we are seeing that the first wave happened, but then the second wave was much bigger than the first wave. So next slide, please. And this is actually what you can see here. So this is um, from June of 2020 up to the present situation, whereby we saw that um, in summer of last year, we had a number of parties. Um, specifically, we had one um, party which was called takeover party. And literally, it was a takeover of the virus over our population. Because um, uh, literally from that point onwards, we started seeing a number of cases happening, a number of clusters happening, and this led to an increase in the number of cases. Up to then, um, by summer, we had to take further control measures and limiting also um, the openings of more um, risky um, places like um, the discos, the clubs, bars, which were my, more of the higher risk. And that um, flowed us through um, the autumn um, until um, also um, Christmas time, whereby we had started um, with schools um, quite well. Um, we didn't have any major clusters in our schools and it worked quite well. However, Christmas, even though we tried um, to control as much as we can, we had another small peak just after Christmas um, because um, this was related to the events that happened um, around Christmas time, mainly people um, meeting each other in the homes, but also having um, parties as well. So that led to another increase, which kept on increasing um, up till March. What happened in March of this year, we had um, uh, the peak of the pandemic, 
as you can see, this is um, a much bigger peak than the peak we had last year, which is quite typical of pandemics. And what happened at that stage was a stage whereby we had to um, take another drastic action into, um, again, um, going for um, closure of schools. It was just about two weeks before Easter holidays, and we all had to close the non-essential shops again, um, closing down of bars, closing down of restaurants, so drastic action taken again up because um, the main worrying thing we had was that we had um, the number of patients who were in intensive care unit um, reached a peak of over 20 cases. And that was the threshold for us. We had also um, 500 cases in one day. So that was a threshold which led us to um, take drastic action. And as you can see, then it was beautifully going down again. However, this year we had something which is different. We had the vaccine. So as you can see that line of the vaccination uptake, which um, came in beautifully. So as you had the cases going down with the control measures, you had the population coverage with vaccination going up. So um, taking control um, and at the same time um, having vaccination and protecting the population. So next slide. So as you can see this, it's clearly having um, two main waves. Um, uh, one, um, the second wave, which is bigger than the first wave. And as you start seeing a uh, higher um, uh, population coverage with the vaccination, you will see that it beautifully goes down back again. So that is clearly that vaccination does work. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so the key epidemiological parameters is that um, we have an average 680 um, per 100,000 population at the peak. Um, Basically, with males and females, started off with more males than the females, but then it picked up, so it's, it's almost equivalent. One of the biggest strategies we had, and the strongest, was that um, we um, had a very um, strong testing strategy. We wanted to find out all the cases that we could find out. So we wanted to test, test, and test. So this was the main strategy, to find any cases that we have there in the population. Um, and in fact, up to now, we have actually done 969,704 tests. Remember, our population is 442,000 population. So this is quite um, a high percentage of our population who have been um, tested. And this includes both the PCR test and also the rapid test. And so right now, um, uh, we have had um, 420 deaths in total from the beginning of the pandemic. Um, the total cases we had were up to now is 30,595. And currently, um, we have only 26 active cases. And in fact, we had quite, over the past um, days, we had quite a number of zero cases being reported. In fact, today is another one of them as well. Next slide, please. Um, so if you look at the seven day moving average, you know, um, Malta is even more particular because we have a small population. So any changes in the small numbers that we have will actually affect, so we take um, the seven day moving average, which right now is one case per day, a seven day moving average. And if you look at next slide, the positivity rate, um, which we base a lot on um, positivity, and we have also worked hard as Malta to also en um, encourage the ECDC, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, to also take into consideration positivity rate, because it's one thing that you have a country which doesn't test, obviously, the number of cases you see in that country will be low. But if you have a country which tests a lot, obviously, then um, you will see that having more cases. And this is why we are using the positivity rate. And currently the positivity rate is 0.1%. Next slide, please. Um, another important um, vulnerable group is the elderly. And even more vulnerable are the elderly in the old people's home, because you know that um, you have a congregation of vulnerable population. And once you have um, a cluster within these homes, then it is very likely to spread to the other countries. Um, we took strict infection control measures. However, you, can all, you will always, as you know, have breaks in the infection control chain. So we did experience this, sadly enough, because we had um, clusters in our old people's homes. We had quite a number of deaths from the old people's homes. So this was like the tragedy for us. And however, um, we um, put in strict infection control measures, strict um, testing of all the residents regularly and also of all the stuff. And that led to a decrease in the clusters. And as we had the first vaccinations, 
the residents and the staff in the old people's homes were the first to be targeted. And in fact, uh, we got our vaccination um, the first flight came in on Boxing Day. So that was a beautiful day, just the day after Christmas. And on the 27th of December, we started vaccinating. And next slide. And this is, um, this is the result of um, when you really have vaccination, um, a high coverage of the population within the old people's homes. As you can see here, we have very, very few um, cases happening in old people's homes, and most of these will be either asymptomatic or else they would have minimal symptoms as well. The other sector, which is very important for us as well, next slide please, is schools. Um, we have put as priority health, However, we um, have always throughout as a tradition more to put um, education as a priority as well. And we um, uh, have seen um, the importance of education and we want to do whatever we can to be able to leave schools open. So we have um, opened the schools um, in September and we have kept the schools open and only actually had to close them for two weeks um, in March of this year when we had the peak. Um, we didn't have any um, cluster, big clusters um, from our schools. In fact, um, we only had um, a few clusters and they were small. However, the biggest impact was on quarantine. Because as you understand, we had um, strict mitigation measures in schools with um, distances between the desks, bubbles of children who don't mix with each other, different breaks so that they will not mix with each other. And children also wearing masks, um, uh, even within the classes if they're um, over 12 years of age. Um, and this was important as well um, to be able to limit the spread. However, still, if you had cases, then you would have required a quarantine of people. So the biggest burden that we had from schools was not actually the number of cases within the schools, but the number of people you had to put into quarantine. Because remember, if you put a child um, into quarantine, then um, the rest of the household, the whole family will have to quarantine as well. And this is the burden that we saw in terms of quarantine within the schools. Next slide. So, and this is like the... Um, primary and also the secondary contact of the cases that we had in, in quarantine. Next slide. Uh, our experiences within our hospitals. Um, in Malta, we have one main state hospital in Malta, and then we have another hospital in Gozo, our sister. And um, so it is even more essential that we had to protect our hospital. So we managed to convert um, like the medical school library into a, 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 a award for COVID patients, um, we increased the number of ITU beds to be able to um, reach up to the capacity um, that we, um, from our modeling, expected to have. And this is what we had in terms of the number of um, patients who were admitted. And our key parameter was the ITU beds. We um, strived hard that we won't come to the um, situation that we had to choose if we can manage a patient in ITU or not. We wanted ITU beds to be available for all our patients if they actually needed an intensive care bed. And we managed to do that. And as I've told you before, when we reached our threshold of 20 cases in our ITU, we immediately went into um, stricter control measures. And right now, as of today, we only have one patient um, in our hospital, and we've been a couple of um, weeks as well with no ITU patients as well um, in our hospital. Next slide. With respect to um, deaths, um, we had 420 deaths. Um, as you can see, they were peaking, mainly when we had the peaks, the outbreaks and clusters in the old people's home. But now we have um, a decreased um, number of deaths, and we have had um, a number of days as well without any deaths at all. Um, next slide. What's happening now within the community? So right now within the community, um, we do have a number of sporadic cases. So these are the cases where you don't identify where the cases have originated from. And these are the most worrying because that means that you haven't broken the chains of transmission within your community and um, that you know that the virus is still spreading there through at a low level, but it is still spreading. So any um, issues with gatherings of people may lead to further clusters again. Um, the majority of cases, almost half of them, um, are also imported. Um, we'll talk about border control later. So this is having an impact as well um, on our number of cases. Next slide. 
um, variants. So variants have always been one of the main strategies that we struggled um, to um, decrease the number of variants that we have. Um, right now, we have um, almost half of our cases with the alpha, the um, variant which originated first um, in the UK. We had um, uh, 31 cases of the variant which originated from Brazil. Um, majority of these were um, related to a cluster um, of youths who um, uh, were in a university residence and they all originated from one single case which was imported from France. And um, we also had seven cases of the South African variant and we had only one case of the Delta variant. Now, so we are being, being very careful, especially with the Delta variant, because we know that um, the transmission um, of the virus is more than the wild type of the COVID, um, as much as about 50%. So that is, um, in brief, the epidemiology. So let's go to the control measures. Um, uh, so basically, our main um, scope in the control measures was initially um, as I had explained before, detection um, of cases, um, reporting and analysis. And as we know with all surveillance, the information that you get from surveillance is fed back into the loop of um, policy formulation. So we have um, daily um, reports being generated, which will feed into policy formulation in terms of control measures. As I said, we had enhanced testing. Um, going, preparing these slides for you, um, uh, took me back in the beginning um, of the pandemic where we actually started going testing in the actual homes of the of the cases that we had suspected. However, that wasn't sustainable anymore and we started developing swabbing centers. So we have swabbing centers which are drive-through um, swabbing centers. People actually go with their own car um, and they get swapped, they go home and wait for the results. For people who are not, um, do not have um, uh, car, car um, services because we don't allow them to go um, by means of transport, obviously, to limit transmission, we actually offer transportation as well. No more, less small. So we offer transportation for those people who do not have transport. If we have people who are not ambulant, we actually have a team who actually goes to their homes of the patients. So this is the free of charge services that we offer um, for people in terms of both PCRs and also rapid tests. And we have a protocol when rapid tests are required, because as you know, the sensitivity for rapid tests are not as high as the PCRs. We have um, the public health COVID response team split up into teams. Um, so we have the case management team, which works with um, actually working the cases, identifying from where could have been the source, and then it moves on to the contact tracing team who identifies the contacts of patients through a risk assessment, through protocols, whereby the contacts which are identified as close contacts will be put in quarantine for 14 days. And then we had the team with the follow-up um, team, um, which were um, a group of people who were following up the patients. Initially, they were doing it on a daily basis, but however, as the cases increased, we had to reduce the, the follow-up. However, we um, continue to follow up the patients as well, both clinically and also from the public health aspect, and also their contacts. So if any contacts um, develop any symptoms, we would test them as well so that we can identify any more cases. We also developed um, uh, case um, uh, symptom surveillance so that we can identify those people who are having symptoms um, and not coming forward for testing to see the background rate as well what's going on for those not coming forward. And also very, very important, the prevention campaign, societal measures and enforcement. Um, uh, right now, um, very critical and crucial is the enforcement aspect of the um, whole pandemic control. Next slide. So this is the PCR tests um, that we were doing. We had swabbing centers go to more than those of Ngozo. And next slide is also the rapid test. So as you can see, um, as we had um, increased the uh, number of swaps being carried out, as well, now we are seeing that even the positivity rate for rapid tests has also decreased. Next slide. Um, contact tracing is our forte. Uh, we um, do strict um, uh, interviewing of all contacts and also of the, of the contacts of the cases. And also we have um, the COVID Alert Malta, which is a contact tracing app, which um, this is um, interoperable with 19 member states within the European Union, whereby you download this app on your mobile, 
And then if you would have been within um, close proximity of a positive case, then your mobile will alert you that you had been in contact um, with a positive case, and then you will go for testing. This is anonymous. What happens is if you have a positive case, we give them, if they would have had their app on their mobile, we give them a code. They insert this code within their mobile, and then the message will go to all those people who would have had their app um, on, switched on, which is very important, and would have been in contact with that person. This is all anonymous. They wouldn't know who the positive case is. And we have found that we have had um, people identified as contacts, which wouldn't have been identified by the usual interviewing process. Next slide. Reused um, technology. Um, so we have uh, adapted the Go Data database, which was um, the WHO database for Ebola, um, to, you, to be used for COVID, which um, helped us a lot even in the um, contact tracing as well. Symptom Checker as well was an app as well. We have this COVID alert motor, which is the contact tracing app. We used um, open source technology um, for our apps as well. Telehealth, we had been um, lobbying for telehealth in Malta for quite a while and it started slowly. However, COVID kicked it off. And this is one of the advantages that I see and with COVID, which is something we need to keep as well. So we were um, looking after the COVID patients um, who were managed within their homes because they had minor symptoms or no symptoms at all by means of telemedicine. And we use telemedicine also for other health services as well, which is very good. Um, and also three-dimensional printing we used. In fact, we had um, companies who actually um, did three-dimensional printing for the, um, the masks and also the visors, um, uh, which um, really worked out well. You remember that um, basically in the beginning we had um, uh, very um, few availability of the visors. So this company, local company, um, used um, 3D digital printing as well to develop the visors as well. So next slide. Um, with respect to management of patient resources, next slide, please. Is, um, you remember at the beginning it wasn't easy um, uh, to procure PPE and equipment like ventilators, um, but our um, uh, people in the procurement unit, which my colleague Mark um, was part of this um, great team, they managed to procure. And the secret about procurement was that they um, actually tapped various markets globally so that um, you don't rely on one market, but get whatever you could. And this is um, what we have done. We got whatever we could, but always maintaining the standards that um, we um, got um, the equipment, which was up to standard, including the masks and also the visors and also any other equipment and also the medicines. Um, uh, so next slide, transition. Um, uh, what was the transition, transition strategy? Basically, it is based on the fact that um, we wanted to protect our healthcare system. So we couldn't allow the number of cases to increase beyond a certain point because we know the implications were that um, apart from the repercussions on possible deaths, um, we also could have a system which would be saturated and we never wanted to have um, uh, limitations on the availability of beds and care. So as we saw that um, cases would increase, we would enforce more um, on our control measures. Next slide. So we had a number of requisites for the transmission um, uh, trans strategy. So next slide. Um, most important was the, the, the surveillance system, which is very important that you need to have detection, reporting, and analysis of data, which is ongoing all the time. Capacity for testing, as I said, that is essential. Communication, very essential as well. Case symptom surveillance and also monitoring and evaluation of the interventions. Next slide. Public health capacity. Um, we are a small team in Malta, as everything. Um, so we had, um, in fact, um, the staff who used to work with me on public health aspect within the surveillance unit for infectious diseases were very, very few. So what happened was that we got all the public health specialists and even trained other people, other healthcare professionals, and to join the team. And this is the public health capacity which we managed to um, develop um, into looking at the process management, case management, contact tracing, case follow-up and quarantine as well control, and also looking at emerging digital technologies and also having the infrastructure for isolation as well. Next slide. 
very important as well for the um, transition is the health system capacity because it is important that the scope is that we need to continue to provide quality care to all our patients. Remember, um, COVID didn't um, take all other chronic diseases which went on going. We had to keep on um, providing the best of excellent care um, for our patients as well. However, we had to reduce a bit of the non-urgent um, matters as well. Next slide. Also essential is the community engagement. It is very important that we had the community on our side. So we based um, our community engagement through um, trust, acceptance, behavior and compliance. This wasn't so difficult in the beginning in the first wave because it was everything new. People were seeing the start of this pandemic, they started seeing cases, they started seeing people being admitted to hospital, started seeing that, so everyone was complying. However, with the second wave, um, compliance was much harder to control. And as we are now, it is even much harder to control. So these are the challenges that we really have right now. And also ongoing assessment of measures. And next slide. Um, very important is the protection of the vulnerable people, which is important was the key because we knew that these are the people who will suffer most. And next slide. And very crucial was how shall we start relaxing the public health measures? So this was one of the most difficult parts whereby we knew that when we are talking public health, we look at the holistic aspect of the population because it is very easy if you say, okay, we will remain within restricted measures, um, schools will remain closed, our shops will remain closed, we keep everywhere closed. Like if you go um, in the streets of our main capital city, it was like a pity seeing everywhere closed. However, we knew that this was going to be something long-term, so we couldn't remain that way because we knew that if a person is unemployed, if a person is falls into poverty, then that is going to affect the health of that patient as well. So we had to move on. So the main thing was that how shall we um, start relaxing without um, having um, drastic um, increases again? And what we did was, next slide, that we identified a number of criteria um, to assess um, the relaxation of the public health measures. And by means of these uh, criteria, we assessed um, whether a um, particular measure uh, was high risk or not. So something very easy was that, for example, if you had um, uh, people who would be um, uh, opening up to of the shops like hairdressers, if you have good mitigation measures, like the number of people going in the salon um, and also the measures that the hairdresser would take, that was much lower risk than having like a bar which is open. So this is how we reopened back um, slowly, slowly, and in fact, it's only been um, very recent that we actually reopened the bars, which were one um, of the highest um, risk as well. We still have the highest um, uh, measures in place, which are like the, the clubhouses, like the discotheques, which are still closed, because obviously we know that standing up events are still um, limited because they are high risk. Next slide. And also um, very important is transitioning of healthcare services. With the number of people within our hospital, as I said, we had to limit the um, types of services that we had to deliver. So as we started relaxing the measures, as we saw that the numbers could permit, as the number of cases in hospital reduced, then we started then also introducing also the transitioning of healthcare services and also um, uh, working with the public uh, private sector to also provide healthcare within the private sector, which would be provided free of charge to patients, but paid by the government as well. Next slide. Okay, so as we're trans transitioning um, out of the stringent control measures, we were starting slowly, slowly to return back to normal. And next slide, please. Communication. This is one of the most important things that we are seeing. Um, uh, because we had um, a trustful relationship with our population. So first important thing is know your audience, understanding what your audience is, is thinking so that you will tackle um, their issues and also um, tackle immediately any misinformation which is going on in the community. It's very important that we were managing the content um, of our information campaigns, calming fear. Um, this was very essential because obviously we 
um, the worst thing that you can have is that you um, have fear within your population because people then will start um, reacting um, in ways that you cannot really control them. And actually, our main thing was that actually we wanted to move fear into growth. That people, and um, we start innovating, even those people who would have um, lost their jobs because their job was risky, they started innovating and moving to other jobs as well, and also facilitating the community. Next slide. So in terms of communication, we had a dashboard which is available for data. This, we had the raw data, they're available, so we could um, see journalists, we could see statisticians doing their own analysis of the data, and also people were being fed with information. Next slide. Um, we have, in Malta, um, television is very popular. We have a lot of our population which um, watches television and also social media. So we use these um, uh, mediums to be able to communicate with the public. Um, in my position as superintendent of public health, I used to do daily briefings daily briefings at 12.30 every day, um, giving information um, on the epidemiological situation and also advice on prevention measures and also explaining the relaxation measures and also the mitigation measures that we have in place when you relax um, a measure in itself. Um, uh, as we started having control of the situation, then we reduced these um, to three times daily and then we reduced them to once weekly only. So. Um, this was one of the uh, most important um, things we had in the communication. As you can see, we also had um, uh, people for um, the deaf and the dumb who would um, uh, be helping them as well to communicate. And this was live streamed also um, on Facebook for people um, who um, would be following social media as well. This is apart from all the interviews um, within the, on radios, et cetera, um, and television as well. Next slide. Apart from that, we issue every day this infographic um, at 12.30 every day, which looks at um, uh, the number of cases that we had the, from the day before, the number of any, any additional deaths, the number of tests that we do, and also um, when you start the vaccination, include the vaccination data as well. Next slide. So we had print media, social media, radio slots um, on COVID. And also, next slide, um, using also information campaigns um, on staying healthy. Um, not forgetting um, the rest of the health of the, of the person is very important as well, because obviously um, we needed to maintain people within a healthy um, lifestyle as well, because we knew that COVID would affect more people if they are not um, healthy. Next slide. So um, vaccination is the positive thing about COVID. So. Um, as a vaccination strategy, this is led by um, the Head Ministry for Health within um, a professional team. And we had various vaccination centers all over the country, both in Malta and in Gozo. We actually converted um, like a part of the university, part of our um, schools as well um, into vaccination centers. We used our um, health centers as well to, for vaccination. We used to go also um, to people who are not mobile, to vaccinate them at their home. Remember, this wasn't easy. The beginning, we were using Pfizer. So the strict um, cold storage facilities um, presented that challenge. However, um, we managed to uh, circumscribe also that challenge as well. So we started with our vaccination program on the 27th of December. And actually, as we are now, as we're speaking, we have over 80% of the adult population aged over 16 years of age who have at least taken one dose um, of the vaccine. And we have 67% of our population, adult population, who has already taken the full course of the vaccination. And um, the main um, secret about this is also that, um, basically, we have reached out to the general population as much as we can. Um, trying to uh, mitigate any uh, misinformation that will be going on, um, getting on board health professionals who would be going on the media, speaking about vaccination, which is very important as well, and also that we had a good procurement strategy. So our, our um, colleagues at the procurement unit did an excellent job. They procured the vaccines. We got um, the vaccines through the advanced purchase agreement of the European Union, the joint procurement agreement. And we have actually all the vaccines which are um, European Medicines Agency approved, which include Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. 
And so we are um, providing all these vaccinations um, to our population. And we also um, have a strategy that we don't leave anything in the fridge. So basically, as the stocks come in, then we were disseminating to the um, population. Very important as well is that we um, looked at um, in the initial stages of the vaccination rollout, we wanted to protect those who are most vulnerable. So we kicked off with healthcare workers, we kicked off with the elderly, and we started going down um, by age groups so that we would target the most vulnerable, the elderly first, and then going down by age groups. We targeted our healthcare workers, we targeted as well the care workers who work within the old people's homes. And then we moved on to other groups, including the essential workers, like um, the police, the army, um, the persons who work um, in the enforcement aspect. And then eventually we continued working down into um, the age groups. So right now, um, the vaccination program is open to anyone aged over 16 years of age. And so next slide. So the rollout methodology is based on um, looking at careful planning of the shipment schedules that we have for vaccination, um, having a strict inventory and management set up, okay? and also compilation of the cohorts which are eligible at that particular time and disseminating. Very important, backing all this up was having a robust database, which as we will come to the vaccination certificate, see how important it is. Next slide. So um, this is where we are now. Um, all those people aged over 16 years, um, and they are either residents of Malta and entitled to healthcare, um, they can come forward with free vaccination. We have also started the program for the children, adolescents aged between 12 um, to 15 years of age. And we're looking forward as well to the outcome of the um, US ACIP as well, um, to see also their comments on this age group as well. Next slide. Okay, so this is one of the slides of the campaign. Um, in fact, it is in Maltese as well. So people would be um, actually registering their intention um, to be vaccinated via um, this website it's called Vaccine. Vaccine is vaccine, vaccine in, in Maltese. Machine.gov.mt, or as they can send us an SMS, and then within a few days, they will receive an appointment in one of the centers that we have all over the island. So, what are the goals of our vaccination rollout? Next slide. Um, so, basically, we want to ensure the best possible use of the vaccination throughout, and um, we want to maintain momentum, um, increasing um, the vaccination coverage, because this also worked favorably because you would. The more people start seeing people get vaccinated, the more people came. So we all know if you have something new in the beginning, you will say, let me wait for the others first. So as you start seeing more people going for vaccination, then um, this works really well. Okay? And also um, maxim maximize as well um, the outputs that we have and also being sure that we can cater for the appointments that we were sending also for the first dose and also ensuring we have supplies for the second dose as well. So next slide, this is where we are right now. Um, we have exceeded the target of the European Union of 70% coverage of the adult population. And as I said, we have 80% coverage um, with at least first dose and 67% um, with second doses. Next slide. Um, I'm sorry for Kelly, colleagues. I have to compare this, um, and you can see US there as well. So we're proud of this um, vaccination. So I'm hope that um, uh, with our experiences, it can help you get more there. Obviously, as you grow um, more towards um, achieving a higher um, vaccination coverage, then the more difficult it becomes because we know that um, you start plateauing. In fact, we're seeing some countries like Israel has been plateauing into at sixty percent. So we're still rising right now, but obviously the increase isn't as steep as it started in the beginning. So um, this is the challenge which now comes to continue to achieve. Our new target is achieving 85% um, coverage rate of our adult population with two doses. So that is the next um, challenge we have. Next slide, vaccine certificate. Um, so remember that we do that we were um, inputting all the data of those people who were vaccinated in our vaccination database, 
And this is how um, the people will go into this website and they can actually generate the vaccine certificate themselves. Next slide. And this is how the vaccine certificate looks. Um, and actually this can be used at the airport with a barcode reader. Um, and then it will pop up that this is a valid vaccine certificate. So people will be able to pass through the airport as well. And we will be using these for other incentives as well. So as from 1st of July, anyone who has this vaccine certificate will be able to remove the mask when they are outside. Malta, we have a heat wave right now, so everyone is eager um, to remove the masks. So we told them, go and get vaccinated, then you can remove your mask. So this is one incentive. And we're also looking at um, incentivizing more the public by having even events uh, whereby people will can um, enter these events if they are fully vaccinated as well. So this is giving more pushes, especially to youths, um, so they will come forward more as well. As you have heard um, as well, um, the European Union is working on the um, EU COVID vaccination as well um, certificate, um, which has three main aspects. One of them is the vaccination. The other one is having a test and the other one is the recovery certificate. Um, Malta is not accepting the recovery certificate. Um, recovery certificate is if you had been positive in the previous six months, then you would have a recovery certificate. We are not accepting this because we um, don't think that the science is robust enough that you have a person who was positive um, would have enough immunity. So from the studies that we have been seeing, we saw that the immunity is not enough. So we, we are not risking. So the only um, things that we accept at our border is the vaccination certificate and in certain circumstances as well, the PCR testing certificate as well. So as from 1st of July, we will be hooking on the EU platform and then we will be able to recognize other um, EU um, vaccine certificates and other EU member states will be able to recognize as well our own certificates. Next slide. So the benefits um, of um, vaccination is the health benefits for the individual, benefits for the community in terms of herd immunity, for travel, and also, as I said, attendance to events and removal of masks. Next slide. Um, border control. So border control. Malta is an island, so um, we have um, arrivals either by flights or else by um, sea. Um, so we don't have the land transport. So how do we do it? Um, we um, frequently assess the epidemiology of the countries in looking at the positivity rate and um, the number um, of cases, so the incidence rate, and also the number of variants within that particular country. And we classify countries as green. So green would be where people would be able to travel with no documentation at all. We had a point where we had that. However, we saw that that was risky. So um, actually what we did was that we have removed any um, of the green, and actually um, uh, there is no green um, uh, countries, and anyone who is coming will fall either the red or the amber countries, as I have, will explain. Amber list is um, for those countries um, which have a positivity rate less than 4%, and they can actually, those list of amber um, uh, countries or states, as I can explain also for US, um, they will be able to come to Malta if they either have a vaccine certificate, which is valid and recognized by Malta. So up to now we have the Maltese vaccination certificate, which is recognized. However, with from 1st July, we'll be able to recognize other member states within the European Union as well. And we're also working with a number of other countries um, outside Europe to be able to recognize their certificates as well um, by means of bilateral agreement with that country as well. So um, then we have the red list. Um, the red list is for countries where the positivity rate is between 4 and 10. So these are countries where the risk is a bit more. So for these countries, we, have, um, uh, we are accepting people to come to Malta from these countries. However, they would need to have a valid vaccination certificate. We don't allow them in with just a PCR because we know that a PCR has limited as well. Um, protection as well and identification of cases. And then we have the dark red list, whereby for the dark red list, um, basically people cannot come to Malta um, unless um, there would be repatriation of Maltese residents or Maltese citizens, or else in very essential um, people who will need to come for 
um, uh, to Malta. And in that case, they will need to do a test and also um, be in quarantine for 14 days. Next slide. So um, this is um, the list that we have currently for Amber Zones. So you can see a number of countries. And if you um, see these, these are the countries who are doing well as well in terms of vaccination. Next slide. What have we done for US? Um, it's only been recently from the 17th of June that we have um, converted US into some states into Amber. Because we were um, looking at the epidemiology of the US um, as a whole country. Um, however, we realized that, as you know very well, there are some states um, which haven't improved as yet, um, and some of the states are doing very well. So we decided to um, split up the US into states and treat them as if they are an individual country. So here we um, have a number of states whereby um, people um, can come um, to Malta from these states um, if they have either a valid vaccination certificate or else by means of, of a PCR test. And next slide, these are the red zones whereby people can come from these red zones um, if they have only a vaccination certificate as I have explained before. Next slide. So literally what happens is um, when you are um, arriving in Malta, um, it is very important that um, there will be documentation checks which are made. One of them is the submission of a passenger locator form. Um, this includes the details of the passenger, including contact details and also where that person is going to be living. And this is very important if we have any case, um, either on the flight or develops within two days of arrival in Malta, we need it for contact tracing. As from 1st of July, we will be going digital as well with this. Um, and also um, either the, um, uh, the vaccine certificate, which is checked at the airport or else the um, test which is required as well. So um, lessons learned. Next slide I would like to share with you. Um, basically, um, uh, what we've learned from all this is that um, we need to act fast, have instruments which are available to us to act fast as well. Um, policy needs to be based on scientific advice and also have feedback for surveillance. We need to have robust surveillance systems and public health capacity and health systems capacity to adapt very quickly. Public health communication needs to be based on science and transparency. Believe me, this has been very important. People question and we need the science to back us up. Okay? Investment in resources and HR and including training and also uh, motivation. We, as the COVID public health response team, um, had also the psychological support um, all along the way as well, because we were working and still are working very long hours. So we had psychological support for all the team as well. Um, ongoing. Public private par partnerships have worked very well, joint procurement and the advanced purchase agreement both for um, PPE and especially for the vaccination. And we really hope that this works even for other things, like, for example, um, antimicrobials, um, which um, could be one of the future ways how we can um, uh, buy as well these antimicrobials as well. Um, global coordination as well. I mean, we cannot have um, countries within this global world who are still having foci um, of COVID transmission in this global world of medicine. And research is very essential. Next slide. So these are some of the take home messages as well. The whole of government approach is essential. Wide public health communication strategy, prioritization of public health with economic and social support, which was essential as well. Ensure the continuity of high quality care. Always also transitioning um, is very important and being very careful. Okay? Gradual mitigated transmission. So if you're leaping, you leap a small height, not too much because um, leaping too much will um, kick off a high number of cases. And also very essential is rebuilding of the economy. So next slide is opening up the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Gauti, for your excellent presentation. Pleasure to hear you. We have some questions also from the audience. The first question is from Professor Charles McKay who is past president of the American College of Medical Toxicology. Uh, he's saying, um, one of your earlier slides showed the decline in new documented infections and the rise in vaccination percentage in the last few months. 
do you think that passing the 50% or 70% mark with practically no new infections is indicative of reaching herd immunity? Or are there still restrictions on entry into Malta or other control measures in place currently? Um, this issue of herd immunity, um, I, I see that um, colleagues, epidemiologists treat it with, um, we're very careful about um, uh, talking about herd immunity because we all understand that herd immunity is not something you achieve and you maintain because we know that herd immunity is the number of people who are vaccinated over the total population. And we know that right now, as we are flowing in the tourist um, season, our um, denominator, our um, population is changing very frequently. So what we are seeing is um, having um, a number of people vaccinated um, out of our total population, the rest of the population, we know how many are vaccinated, but we're not sure of the influx of the tourists that we are having and how much they are vaccinated or not as yet. So if you have a large influx of tourists coming forward, especially, for example, youths, who we know that many countries haven't managed to achieve, um, to offer vaccination to the youths yet. So that will lead to increasing your denominator of people who are not vaccinated. So your herd immunity will drop. So this is something which we are very careful about. So we are increasing as much our vaccination coverage to make sure that we get our um, people protected and also being careful of what's going in um, within our airports and our seaport as well, but also having an um, opening up with mitigation measures. So if you go to a restaurant, it's not the restaurant we used to know before. We have the tables um, which are separated by means of two meters. If you're getting up from your table, you need to wear back your mask on um, until you go out. If you're outside in the community, you need to wear the mask unless you are vaccinated as firm 1st of July. So any openings that we had are all with mitigation measures. So this is like the new normal that we have right now. Very good. I would like to ask you also a question with regards to um, opening up schools, for example, and the different measures taken with different levels of education, primary schools, secondary schools, tertiary schools, and also the liaison with educators, with the ministry, um, to arrive to the best decisions with regards to the opening up of schools. Yes, in fact, as I said, we wanted to um, maintain schools as open as much as we can, because we knew how much children suffered. I mean, this was like two years of their lifetime. Um, so um, we saw that, um, the children, the younger children, especially we know that um, if children are young um, and they're um, affected by COVID, there aren't so many complications as older um, adults. So we could allow younger children in bubbles um, attending to schools with mitigation measures, um, having separated bubbles, um, and that worked well. For post-secondary schools, when we reopen the schools now um, in this scholastic year, we have um, asked them to remain working, having um, uh, working from home, studying from home, um, because we know that this group, like the post-secondary over 16, are the ones who are more liable to be um, positive because obviously they go out and they enjoy themselves as well. So they have more um, chance of getting um, infected. And we also wanted to make sure that um, at this stage in their life, in the post-secondary and at university level, they will manage as well to do the exams, which were essential, and most of them had missed it last year. So we tried to protect um, health, but at the same time as well, protect education so that we will have um, a generation which would have not missed um, two years of their schooling. Very good, thank you. Another question? So in some US states, they've worked with the airlines to do pre-screening of return travel requirements, either vaccination cards or 72 hour negative testing to avoid the need to verify this information upon arrival. Has or will Malta look at initiating a similar process? Um, well. So basically, um, yes, as I explained, Malta, um, uh, for people who are coming in, 
um, they need to present either vaccine certificate or else a negative PCR um, carried out within the previous 72 hours from arrival in Malta if it is an amber zone. If it is a red zone, they will need only, they cannot present a negative PCR, they will need to have um, the vaccination certificate. Very good. And with regards to also the harmonization of recognition of vaccination certificates, um, also with regards to countries which are beyond the EU, um, is this being worked out on a country by country basis or on a continental basis, European basis? Uh, for EU, we will be working through the um, uh, EU vaccination certificate. Um, uh, so that is something which is natural. We have a whole network, e-health network, which works together and we recognize each other's certificates. It will be on one platform. However, for um, countries outside EU, we are working on a case-by-case -case basis with an individual member state directly. Very good. Another question also with regard to the vaccine type. Um, how do you choose what vaccine type to give to individuals? Or does it depend on the availability type? So um, there isn't a choice which vaccine you can take. The only thing is um, looking at the SPC of the vaccine. So, for example, um, the only vaccine which can be given under 18 years of age is the Pfizer vaccine, because the rest, the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Moderna is only indicated for 18 years upward. The rest um, then um, is given according to the availability. Very good. Um, I would appreciate also if you could expand on um, how to tackle vaccine hesitancy. Though there were, in many countries, this was quite a big problem of um, anti-vaxxers. But also, you know, there are um, some people who are genuinely worried about side effects, adverse reactions. I'm aware that in Malta there were special clinics for these um, people who um, have history of allergies. So how did you um, tackle this, Prof. Gauti? Yes, um, in fact, um, we tackled vaccine hesitancy. And first of all, we don't have the anti-vaccine lobbying that some countries may, may have. In fact, um, for childhood vaccinations like MMR, we have very good uptake, over 95% uptake in our children. Um, we tackled this through good communication. Um, uh, also, we got on board other specialists as well um, to be able to support us as well in, in the vaccination um, rollout as well. And also very important is that when we had people who were afraid um, that they may have some allergies, like you said, we had special clinics within our hospital um, where there would be the specialist, even anesthetist available just in case something happens. So this would give the reassurance to um, the persons if they had suffered from any um, allergies um, before. Yeah, um, yeah, well, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful presentation. I, I do have a, one additional question uh, uh, about the spike in March of 2021, uh, which I think was your largest peak. Uh, what was the uh, explanation behind that? Yes, in fact, um, what we started seeing is that um, remember that um, as the pandemic passed on, we started getting pandemic fatigue. Um, so people started to give up. <laughs> they um, wanted to return back to normal. Um, when people start seeing things going back well, like even now having a zero, for us, I say like, it's better to have one or two rather than have zeros because people will think it's all over. Um, uh, so um, at that point in time, we started people returning back to their normal lives and um, mixing together. And also um, we used to have um, people who were meeting We may have lost her. Uh, wow, is it? Seems so. We have done no. so well. well anyway, she, yeah, we're a little bit over the hour at this point, and uh, you know, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Mark uh, uh, for his wonderful moderation today, and and actually for uh, um, identifying and securing our, our speaker as well, uh, who really gave a superb presentation. Um, much uh, appreciated. I, I think we learned a, a lot about what's going on in your country and many lessons learned for us here in the States. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, so our webinar series uh, 
uh, we'll continue in a couple of weeks on July 7th. Uh, we're going to uh, have another presentation out of our uh, disinfectant mini series. This is going to be on disinfectant sanitizers and reproductive health. And uh, Rose Goldman from uh, the Harvard Medical School and, and Afro Romero from the Department of Health in Utah will be giving uh, this uh, very timely uh, presentation. Next slide. Uh, our whole uh, entire webinar series uh, uh, chronology can be found in our prospectus, and this is also available on our website. Today's presentation was reported and will be up on the website in approximately 48 hours. Again, I'd like to thank our speaker and our guest moderator uh, for their uh, participation today. Much, much appreciated. Uh, thank you very much, and everyone have a good day.